Having just come in from the last 20 odd minutes of Trudy's talk, I thought it was um, a great review of everything that we're going to say, and I'm not sure if we can really say too much more. Um, but a great summary, and I think we um, need to obviously to dwell a little more on the sort of iron metabolism and various other aspects of, of iron. And I was just going to say something about um, iron metabolism, the issues regarding iron deficiency and the high risk groups. I guess suddenly iron's come out of the tunnel as I'll show at the end and is being used in all sorts of areas to improve patient outcomes and quality of care. So. Obviously, iron needs to be um, ingested, Sorry. and we need to absorb it, and we need to metabolize it and use it. And obviously, there is some degree of iron loss as well, but we don't have a good mechanism for losing iron, as you know, when we get overloaded. Um, the body distribution and storage of iron is um, most well known to most of us as undergraduates. It comes in through the upper, lower, upper small bowel and is uh, taken up into the liver, into the red cells, into the muscles, and the reticular endothelial macrophages in the bone marrow. Issues regarding absorption, um, obviously, down the esophagus into the stomach where it, because of the high acidity, most iron gets converted to the ferric state. But in order to absorb it, actually, we have to absorb it in the ferrous state, in the upper lower bowel. And um, we know that phytates, tannins, antacids, H2 antagonists tend to prevent absorption. Indian populations who eat lots of phytates and chapatis and things and little else, I believe, do get iron deficient. And certainly elder, older people here in this country who are taking um, a lot of H2 antagonists tend to become iron deficient as well. So gastric acidity, as I said, is important for solubilizing um, or to help towards solubilizing the ferric state and H2 antagonists. I think that's probably the most important message to get from this slide, does impair absorption. The um, ferric ions taken up through the enterocytes, the lining of the small blood cell, uh, small um, duodenal and ileal cells, and it's converted into the ferrous state by enzymes on the surface of the villi, which is probably better shown here. You can see the ferric state, uh, 3 plus going to 2 plus on the surface of the villi and then getting absorbed. Transported then around by transferrin, and it has to be converted back into the ferric state. It's rather a weird setup. This has to be converted back into the ferric state to be taken up by transferrin and then delivered to the hepatocytes, the macrophages, and other cells in the body. So iron, it's not just for hemoglobin. Um, it's only, I guess, taken me about 50 years to realize that people can be iron deficient when they don't have anemia. Uh, was, um, so we've shown that um, iron is actually important for all sorts of physiological functions. You can be anemic, but you can still be iron deficient. You can still have a low ferritin, and you can still have profound symptomatology because of those low um, ferritins and the relative iron deficiency. So oxygen transfers, cellular respiration, electron transfers, numerous enzymes are iron dependent. And including, more recently, we've shown that people who are chronic cardiac failure, if they've got iron deficiency, absolute or functional, then they can be improved without lots of expensive cardiac medications, but just by giving intravenous iron. 
So um, iron goes and is mainly made up into those uh, tissues taken up by those tissues, myoglobin, cytochromes, and other enzymes. So the average body iron is around 3.8 grams in men and 2.3 in women, which is probably the size of a sort of smallish nail. Um, recommended intake for women is that. Um, I guess that's one woman taking her iron all in one day with a big steak. Wouldn't like to meet her on a dark night. <laughs> or you could consider maybe 21 milligrams by three dozen oysters, if you like oysters. And there's a bit of iron, obviously, in, fo in um, green vegetables. So cellular iron handling, it's very difficult to go into the metabolism of iron in any big way, but certainly for any cell, there is a function. The, the iron has to be taken up into the cell on the top left-hand side there. It has to be stored um, as ferritin, um, the bottom left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, really a representation of all the different enzymatic processes which use iron. So this is just a list. You don't obviously have to know it, and I'm not going to go through it in any, well, in any way at all. But the major proteins involved in iron homeostasis. So you can see that it, you've got the list there, but it regulates so many different processes in the body. Um, so it's understandable that when you are deficient in iron that um, things start going wrong. So in, the, in a UK health service survey uh, back in 2000, as um, Trudy sort of alluded to, it's, anemia is very, very common. And oh, the older you get, the more likely you are to be anemic. Even people with normal hemoglobin but iron deficiency, as evidenced by low ferritins, there's quite a significant proportion of the population who are iron deficient. So the highest prevalence of anemia and iron deficiency in the UK in that survey was men over 65 and women 16 to 44. So just coming on to the causes of iron deficiency, um, there are many and varied, but um, obviously blood loss, and you've got a list there, you can see the list, blood loss generally from the GI tract, from if patients are having dialysis, if they've got heart valves, metal heart valves, often they get intravascular hemolysis and, and the iron is actually lost via the, um, through the urine actually, it's a hemoglobin urea. And sometimes relative fine deficiency by rapid growth during infancy and adolescence. So if, patient, if people do not get adequate iron in those times of their lives, then they may well um, get some sort of long-term problem. And malabsorption clearly is a big issue, especially with celiac disease. So malnutrition, upper GI tract blood loss, esophagitis, gastritis, ulcers, cancer, angiodysplasia. Angiodysplasia seems to be what, to gastroenterologists, what myelodysplasia is to hematologists. You're not quite sure what it really is or why it's there, but um, it seems to cause a problem and it's a good sort of thing a general sort of area to put things into if you haven't quite got the diagnosis. Um, malabsorption, especially with H. pylori infection, um, inflammatory bowel disease, going right up the small bowel contrib can contribute towards um, iron deficiency. And obviously lower GI tract blood losses from polyps and cancers. And I think when you're investigating patients if you speak to any medical oncologist, they know a lot. They have had patients in their 20s and 30s with colonic cancer. And I think it's very important that otherwise unexplained iron deficiency, people should be investigated thoroughly. <laughs> <laughs>
even if they, for example, women with menorrhagia, I mean, there are issues, it's difficult. You can't obviously colonoscope everyone, but I think there may be people that you do need to consider that for. So some of the symptomatology of patients with um, iron deficiency is the fatigue in perhaps young women, the elderly person with chronic iron deficiency in coelonychia, the nail spooning, even hair loss. And many a male might be looking at his hair wondering whether he's got iron deficiency, so maybe you should do that. Um, and that sort of um, sparse loss of hair diffusely across the head or in a sort of rather um, patchy fashion which may occur in some women so with iron deficiency. Um, quite a lot of oral changes in iron deficiency, smoothness of the tongue and the mucous membranes. And uh, when you look at the blood film in severe iron deficiency, you can, the blood film on the right lower there is the normal hemoglobinized red cells and on the left is the uh, microcytic hypochromic red cells indicating iron deficiency. Sorry, indicating a microcytic anemia but not necessarily iron deficiency unless you do the iron studies. <coughs> so in adults, 60% of patients with iron deficiency anemia may have underlying GI tract disorders. So as we said, it's very important to look into that. Um, one interesting aspect of hookworms, allergy and celiac disease is uh, whether um, hookworms, and we all read about we living in too clean an environment these days. We would like to have a little more dirt in our lives um, <coughs> early on in life anyway, and hookworms seem to provide that sort of immunosuppression against celiac disease and other allergies. So, as I mentioned earlier, stages of iron deficiency, um, there are various stages. You can have people who are normal. They have, I guess, the definition of a normal um, bone marrow stores is they've got marrow iron. I'm just trying to, I'm wondering if there's a, oh, here we go. So, so marrow iron stores are normal. Uh, and that's the definition of adequate iron, I guess, is normal iron. But I'm having difficulty with this. Here we go. So normal iron there. And then once you get to iron deficiency, there are no bone marrow iron stores. Um, but as we've said, you can actually have a anemia can be absent. So there are various basically stages you, where you can have full iron stores. And the marrow iron stores are really the gold standard for determining whether someone has iron deficiency. So if you have great difficulty in assessing whether someone is iron deficient, then for a hematologist, the easiest way is usually to do a fine needle aspirate of the bone marrow and see if there's iron, iron present in the um, macrophages there. If there are not, then that patient is clearly border or has iron deficiency by definition, although may have a normal hemoglobin. So once you get down to a, so the normal ferritin, this is the best way of really assessing whether someone has iron deficiency in the absence of chronic inflammation, is that the ferritin is normal and um, the, along there, and then slowly decreases. And once you've got down to a ferritin of sort of below about 15 or even below 30, then you need to consider whether a patient has iron deficiency. So the MCV may remain stable and normal until quite marked iron deficiency. Transferrin saturation is the best way of assessing whether someone has iron deficiency as well. There are two, two main um, 
tests that you can really do, which is the ferritin and the transferrin saturation. They need to be done in combination to ensure that you um, cover the bases in terms of diagnosing iron deficiency. I'll get off this table, I think. Um, interesting aspect to iron deficiency is that in the Franco-Prussian War, Siege of Paris, um, there are all these German troops wandering around northern France with, or from Prussia to France, with big hobnail boots. And this was the first description of what they call March hemoglobinuria, where the red cells broken up in the microvasculature of the um, feet and the people then peed out red urine. That was hemoglobinuria. And it sometimes occurs in athletes today. So iron deficiency in the elderly population in the hepcidin era. Hepcidin is a much touted product that we all need to be able to measure, but we can't measure as yet anyway. So it's one of those sort of weird entities that we know it's raised in chronic inflammation, it impairs iron absorption, et cetera, et cetera. And if we could only measure it, we could then make much better diagnostic decisions. So in the elderly, um, we've found with, if you take the cutoff of hemoglobin around 12 grams per litre, um, the confirmed iron deficiency would be, in general, of serum ferritin of less than, say, 50 micrograms per litre. I know that the, you, a lot of the information and a lot of the levels and, and um, normal values you get from the private labs that are a bit confusing. Um, for sure, a ferritin of less than 10 is absolutely diagnostic of iron deficiency. But we tend to use the thing called the transferrin saturation, and that um, a level of less than 20 indicates that there is insufficient iron getting into the um, red cells, and the patient or the person may be um, functionally iron deficient. So if we go along to the middle level there, a serum ferritin 50 to 100, Again, that's a sort of borderline situation in terms of iron deficiency, but the transferrin saturation is low, so there is quite likely to be iron deficiency. On the right side there, with a the serum ferritin greater than 100 and a transferrin saturation less, uh, greater than 20%, that's the crucial thing, the transferrin saturation greater than 20%, you're probably unlikely to have iron deficiency. It may well be a chronic inflammatory process um, in addition to um, normal iron stores. And you can see it says evaluate hepcidin levels, but as we say, nowhere in the world yet, as far as I'm aware, is hepcidin being, do, being performed routinely. So um, I think in our assessment of the patient, certainly the elderly patient, um, the ferritin below 100 should make you suspicious of possible iron deficiency, and certainly with a transferrin saturation of less than 20%. So you may need to investigate those patients. Consider oral iron therapy, but certainly they need to have their GI tract investigated. Um, one of the other reasons for assessing whether people are anemic or not, or is, is that it's really been shown very well that as you get older, the more li if you have anemia, you are more likely to have an early death. So you can see that in this graph, um, non-anemic men and non-anemic women um, at various age, um, I'm just trying to see what the age was, but in elderly patients, certainly they have a higher death rate 
Well, you could argue that, of course, the reason is that they're anemic because they've got some underlying disease, and that's the obvious situation. So the message there is that you really need to investigate the cause of the anemia. So as Trudy mentioned earlier on, the incidence of preoperative anemia is quite high. Maybe a preoperative anemia and iron deficiency may be quite high, up to 50%. And this is another study which just shows that um, from Austria that uh, as you get older, as you're going towards getting to an operation of some description, then you're quite, as you get older, the rate of anemia or well, incidence of anemia is quite high. So chronic disease is another problem that we're looking into and makes it very difficult to assess whether someone has iron deficiency. So the mechanisms of anemia of chronic disease are that there's usually reduced erythropoietin level, so it reduces the drive to bone marrow to stimulate red cell formation. Um, there's a reduced release of iron from the bone marrow macrophages. The red cell lifespan is usually shortened. An iron deficiency, as I've said, in the presence of chronic disease really is quite difficult to prove. But because of that chronic disease, the ferritin may raise, rise significantly. So just to look at this sort of metabolism of all this, so hepcidin, as we know, is upregulated by inflammation, and enteric Iron absorption generally is impaired if hepcidin is present or increased. And the release of iron from storage is also impaired. Transferrin saturation is therefore decreased, <coughs> so you come to that low transferrin saturation percentage, less than 20. And the ferritin may be increased. Um, so the concept of functional iron deficiency is that the erythroid and other cells are deprived of adequate iron and become functionally iron deficient, yet there is adequate iron present in the body. So the red cell production becomes iron deficient, so you get smaller red cells with microcytic changes. And that functional iron deficiency is a common cause of anemia of chronic inflammation. And how do you circumvent that? Well, that's a sort of an issue that we have been looking at, and we find that in many circumstances that intravenous iron actually does circumvent that hepcidin blockade and can improve the hemoglobin level. So iron <coughs> levels that assist in distinguishing between iron deficiency, anemia, and anemia of inflammation are really the transferrin saturation, which is made up of serum iron and the transferrin <coughs> level. On the left there, the left column is the iron deficiency anemia. Um, and anemia of inflammation is AI in the middle, and then there's both on the right. So you can see that the common, if you just ask for a ferritin, that, which is fine, if it's patient's iron deficient, ferritin will be low. But if the patient has a combination of both um, anemia of inflammation and anemia of inflammation or iron deficiency, the ferritin may be low or normal or raised, so it can't, it's not very useful at assessing alone whether there is iron um, deficiency and chronic inflammation. So in my next talk, actually, I'm going to talk about transferrin receptors and things, so I won't uh, dwell on that here. So basic, the, the bottom line, I guess, the message is just to not just do a ferritin, but to do the complete iron studies when you're trying to assess a patient's anemia. Um, just a cartoon of anemia of chronic disease. The, on the left-hand side there, dietary iron is going into the duodenal cells. And on the... Um, there's a, a, a channel called the ferroportin, ferroprotein channel, which is uh, 
at the bottom in the green. Now, if we just go to the normal in the middle, the iron is going into the enterocyte, into the duodenal cell, and goes through the cell and comes out through that ferroprotein channel. What hepcidin does is disturb that ferroprotein channel and prevents iron getting out of the cell, so it tends to stay there and accumulate. Um, which is a different mechanism, say, for hemochromatosis, where the iron comes in and in the much greater quantities and can't get out just because there's a limitation on its exit through that channel. So it's hepcidin, which is the baddie here, which disturbs the mechanism for allowing the iron to... It will come in to some degree, but it won't get out of those cells. That's just a probably a better representation. Low hepcidin, iron uptake, ferritin goes into cells, goes out through the ferroportin channel. But if there's a high hepcidin, the iron uptake goes into the cells but tends to stay there because that channel's disrupted by hepcidin. That's a neat little cartoon, I really like that, because it tells you everything. Um, so in anemia of inflammation, we have reduced intestinal iron absorption, uptake and retention of iron in storage, erythrocyte lifespan is reduced, the erythroid progenitor cell proliferation and differentiation are reduced, erythropoietin production and activity and, eff and effectiveness on the red cells is reduced, and um, you get an iron-restricted erythropoiesis and you can end up getting anemia and the patient um, this is really independent of depleted normal or increased iron stores. So one paper from the Annals of Oncology kind of gave quite a nice cartoon as to this. Clearly when we're treating patients with chemotherapy for cancer, the marrow gets suppressed, but also they get a, the chronic inflammatory process which prevents uptake and um, proper erythropoiesis occurring. So sometimes you get patients coming in, they're anemic, and those unenlightened oncologists who are not into the PBM program maybe end up giving patients blood transfusion. So they end up giving them more and more blood. And they get more and more iron. You can even get iron overloaded. So um, in cancer, We've got two forms of iron deficiency anemia. We've got the anemia of chronic disease, which I suppose is functional iron deficiency, and we've got the absolute iron deficiency. So on the left there, there's the low hepcidin, ferritin less than 100, transference saturation less than 20%, because obviously in many cancers, patients have been bleeding, they're iron deficient, they're not absorbing, they're not eating properly, so they are actually iron deficient. Whereas on the right side there, you've got functionally iron deficient patients who have high hepcidin, <laughs> sorry, high hepcidin, high ferritin and transference saturation. So it's those patients, or in fact both sets of patients, who might benefit from intravenous iron. And we would, there is much literature out suggesting that such patients should be given intravenous iron rather than transfusions. So, um, this is part of the literature, clinical experience with ferric carboxymaltose um, and chemotherapy-associated anemia. So, conclusion, a substantial hemoglobin increase in stabilization at 11 to 12 in ferric carboxymaltose-treated patients suggests a role for IV iron alone in anemia correction in cancer patients. We don't tend to do that. It's, it's probably something that we really should get into. Uh, but preaching these messages and changing the mechanism or the way patients are managed and changing the behavior of all of us is extremely difficult. So another area that we're looking at, and because it's been well described now in the literature and in the New England Journal of Medicine and other um, papers and journals, is iron and the heart. So the idea is that anemia in the cardiac patient population is very common. Mild anemia has come to be seen as even normal and frequently goes untreated in cardiac failure. 
Anemia contributes to morbidity and mortality independent of transfusion. There are bleeding complications, obviously, in cardiac patients um, that contribute to the anemia because they're on a whole load of different drugs and things which might predispose to bleeding, antiplatelet agents, warfarin, etc. But by treating anemia, and there's a lot of good evidence now, and avoiding transfusion, you can improve the clinical outcomes. So in heart disease, increased morbidity and mortality <coughs> associated with all those things, anemia, transfusion, and bleeding. And in a big study, pool study, they showed that the, um, it was shown that if you had a New York Heart Association grade four degree of cardiac failure, you were more likely to be anemic and iron deficient than in the lesser grades. So what's the etiology of the anemia? We sort of mentioned that briefly, but it's a renal dysfunction because patients often have poor output and obviously their renal function deteriorates. So you get a blunted erythropoietin production. Um, you're on a whole lot of drugs which actually the ACE inhibitors and the angiotensin inhibitors and things can also reduce the EPO production and maybe have a direct inhibitory effect on the bone marrow. And as we mentioned, increased blood loss and anticoagulants. And also reduced iron uptake because of all those things, inflammatory cytokines, PPIs, etc. So what's the impact of anemia on the risk of hospitalization? So in a big study from the States, as usual, uh, Kaiser Permanente study, 59,000 patients adjusting for various variables, confounding variables, they found that with a hemoglobin of less than 90, you were twice as likely to be admitted to hospital as if you had a hemoglobin higher than that. And iron deficiency is an ominous sign in patients with systolic heart failure, 60% increased mortality. So if you're defining the iron deficiency either absolute or functional by ferritin less than 100, or the ferritin may be 100, 299, but with a TSAT less than 20%. The one on the left, the ferritin 100, is defined as sort of iron deficiency, absolute perhaps, but 100, 299, more of functional iron deficiency. With that low transfer and saturation, um, you will find that the patients uh, who do have that have a worse survival than those that don't, so 53% versus 67. So this is something we need to do. We're talking to the cardiologists at Fremantle Hospital. We've set up a study which we hope to be multi across the hospitals in WA, some of the teaching hospitals, and see if we can get some um, improvement in uh, an assessment of those patients with chronic cardiac failure. So there was a New England article back in 2009 which sort of set the cat amongst the pigeons and the ball rolling in looking at this. That paper essentially showed that by giving patients with absolute or relative iron, or sorry, absolute or functional iron deficiency, iron, they, you could improve the six minute walk tests, improve the quality of life with less fatigue and improve the renal function as well as improving the hemoglobin and obviously the iron status. So a number of other studies, European Heart Journal, um, intravenous ferric carboxymaltose significantly improved health-related quality of life after four weeks and throughout the remaining study period. So the, in, the positive effects of the IV iron were independent of anemia status. So outcomes of patients with chronic heart failure in another paper. Treatment of iron deficiency in patients with chronic heart failure reduces the risk of hospitalization without increased adverse events, suggesting its role as a potential therapeutic target in this group of patients. And even ferric carboxymaltose is cheaper than a lot of these other cardiac medications. So another area that we're looking at is inflammatory bowel disease. The prevalence, and I guess most of the GI tract um, departments now in 
and the teaching hospitals and other hospitals, I guess, have um, are aware that your those patients develop anemia and that they will not absorb oral iron. So there's little point in giving them oral iron. And even if they did absorb it, they wouldn't be able to utilize it very well. So the prevalence of iron deficiency in inflammatory bowel disease from 36 to 90%. So systemic iron therapy intravenous that really refers to can improve the hemoglobin and the iron status and improves the quality of life scores. And this is generally independent of the activity of the disease. Iron deficiencies should be managed and should be treated partly, obviously, because of the quality of life aspects, fatigue. But there are things that happen when you have iron deficiency that your uh, platelet count can rise and you can predispose to thrombotic events. And obviously with chronic inflammation you may get an increase in factor VIII and fibrinogen and other clotting factors. So all that might summate into a greater risk of DVTs. Iron repletion and resolution of the anemia may normalize the increased platelet count. So in other, other studies, or many studies have been done, um, FCM prevents recurrence of anemia in patients with a scheme with inflammatory bowel disease compared with placebo. Um, and really, certainly a lot of the intravenous iron are certainly given at Fremantle Hospital is actually given in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, as well as the preoperative patients. So intravenous iron is more effective, better tolerated, and improves the quality of life to a greater extent than oral iron. So, um, Plum of Vincent syndrome, remember that was a sort of a thing where you get um, changes in chronic long-term iron deficiency. You can get a web across the larynx and flattening of the mucosa. Um, something, I don't know, haven't seen that for years, if ever, actually. But that just represents an iron deficient blood film, as well as that larynx. Um, iron deficiency anemia is, is uh, fairly common, so we really need to keep on the ball and try and uh, diagnose it and manage it as best we can. So where the iron comes from that we use, it mostly seems to come from V4 in Switzerland. I don't have any shares in V4, but I wonder if they do use Aussie iron. So in conclusion, um, iron is coming out of the tunnel. It's, there are certain doctors, hematologists you may be aware of in Clinic Path who've been using intravenous iron for years, and he was, it was regarded as a bit of a quirky thing, but um, he's been proven to be right. And when you think back to Barry Marshall and Robin Warren, Barry Marshall has 20 years after he um, found Helicobacter was found to uh, cause ulcers, was recognized as a major issue in improving quality of life of patients, and he got the Nobel Prize. So whether or not anyone will get the Nobel Prize for using more iron, I'm not sure. But uh, So we need to be aware that the role of iron in health is underestimated, that oral iron is not effective in various chronic inflammatory processes, but IV iron is effective. And we, as a hematologist, I don't think there is any place for intramuscular iron. And I know intramuscular iron is actually used not infrequently outside by in general practice. And I know that we get quite a number of patients who are referred in because they hadn't responded to intramuscular iron. And I have no idea, practically speaking, from my own patient populations to whether intramuscular iron does work. And I guess if people give it, then perhaps it does. But I think um, it is probably better to go intravascular iron, intravenous iron, rather than intramuscular iron. So there's also, in patients who have adequate iron stores, um, 
but chronic inflammation, there's been some discussion about whether there's any danger to them by giving intravenous, more intravenous iron. Certainly to date, there doesn't appear to be so, but I think people are going to be concentrating more on that in the future. There's also so the increased risk of these free oxygen radicals and when you give intravenous iron, also the potential risk of infection. One of the ideas was that your low transferrin saturation in chronic inflammation and infection may be starving any bugs that are there of iron so that you're reducing the risk of systemic infection. Uh, so there's that little um, issue been circulating around for years and I don't think anyone's really come to any conclusion about that. So um, thank you, that's all I've got to say. I'd be happy to take any questions.